Tim. Yes, and what Victoria and, and Gaza will be doing will be doing is like is talking about their process project and also the uh, the whole area where they're focused on uh, breast um, breast and uh, colorectal cancer. Um, so um, I'll stop at this stage and um, we will give the presentation to to Victoria. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Tom, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, I'm Victoria, and the project coordinator of, of Persist, and uh, I'm going to make um, a very brief uh, presentation of uh, our project, um, trying to introduce what is going to to explain later my colleague Asihan, um, that uh, who will focus more in the in the visual aspects, uh, the interfaces of uh, this project. So, um, well. Uh, in our next uh, slide, as you can see, um, this uh, Persist project was um, a, a project uh, granted by the European Commission in the frame of uh, the uh, H2020 program. It uh, started uh, in January 2020 and it will finish in February 2023. And in our next slide, you can see uh, our 13 partners from all over the the countries uh, from from Europe and and also uh, Turkey and, and Switzerland. Um, our main uh, objective in in this project, uh, um, you will see it in in our next slide. Um, yeah, uh, our main objective is to address the unmet needs of uh, colorectal and breast uh, cancer survivors, while also helping uh, the, the clinicians uh, in their day-to-day -day, uh, work. So, which are these uh, main worries, uh, these, these main concerns that uh, uh, patients uh, have? Well, um, the cancer recurrence, uh, also the adverse uh, toxic effects after treatment, and then this um, these are meta needs that they uh, usually think that are relate would be solved with uh, a closed follow up, also causes them uh, some anxiety and depression. So, uh, from the point of view of clinicians, uh, they would like to to be able to personalize the treatment and also trying to to solve these uh, these uh, so, uh, problems that. Uh, uh, patients um, uh, explain to them and uh, trying to tackle also the anxiety and depression that uh, this situation uh, causes to, to, to patients. So uh, in the next slide, um, you can see our uh, ecosystem and uh, how we will use uh, the technology to, to try to solve these problems. Um, we have a, a big data platform where uh, many information from patients are stored. Um, we ingest data from the EHR, uh, the, the electronic health records from patients. Uh, this information is related to, for example, to comorbidities, also to can the, the um, cancer disease, treatment, procedures, all this information is ingested in, in our big data platform. And also we have um, a health application, uh, which will be shown later in, in this uh, persistent presentation. Uh, these uh, health applications uh, uh, store um, connects with a bracelet that retrieves uh, well-being data such as steps, uh, sleeping, heart rate, uh, blood pressure, and uh, additionally, uh, some questionnaires asked by a, a embodied uh, conversational agent are uh, performed, and also to trying to detect anxiety and depression, we ask patients to record some uh, videos like a diary. So from those videos, uh, we extracted through the, uh, this multimodal sensing network, some uh, features and parameters that in the end will be processed by some artificial intelligence models and will 
point out some some uh, key points about the 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 personal status the the possibility of being suffering um, anxiety or depression so with all this information we try to address uh, um, as soon as possible uh, the um, to early detect uh, recurrence, uh, adverse toxic effects, and as I said, uh, anxiety and depression. And uh, in our next slide, you can see how uh, all this information is processed in the clinical decision support system, and uh, all these key points are shown in a, a user interface, but for clinicians, not for patients. We always uh, rely um, into clinicians to analyze um, if uh, the AI predictions are, are right or, or, or not, and um, how to address the specific uh, situation uh, for, for patients, and which are the right measures uh, to be uh, to, to use for them. And um, I hope that with this, you have a, a good overview of our project. And um, well, uh, in awareness slide, you, you can see uh, how um, which are uh, the, the the means, the social media that you can use to to follow us. And uh, my my colleague Atikan from from Emoda Software will show the um, different uh, applications that we have developed, uh, and that is the the most visual part of Persist. And I think that you will enjoy. Uh, more than my presentation. Okay, thank you, Victoria. Um, so let me show briefly uh, our apps uh, here. Uh, we have a patient app, uh, which is the main access to the Persis system for the patient. And it works harmony with the big data platform. And the one on the right is the clinician app that they use through the web. Uh, they share data through the big data platform. Uh, it's a secure uh, system, so we uh, respect their privacy and security a lot. Uh, so there's a pin and password. They have to give consent to record any data. And only the patient's doctor can access their records on the big data platform. Uh, data is ingested in the clinician app, their uh, medical history and other things. And data collected in patient application, these both go to the big data platform uh, later to be used uh, in AI algorithms by other parts. able to enter this manually if they track it some other way uh, because we did have some issues with some patients using these bracelets like Victoria had talked about before uh, in the previous talk uh, and we do have emotional uh, status collection with a form we tried many things here we tried blue chicks uh, wheel of emotions but it was hard to put it into a user interface then we landed up in a, a form like this they uh, do enter their uh, emotional status. They um, record diaries, uh, diary videos using a selfie camera of the phone. And, and there are the questionnaires that are on the server that are sent uh, regularly to them for them to answer. And they can also get in and uh, answer themselves. Uh, there are reminders, of course, reminding them what to do uh, when there's a message from the doctor, when they need to uh, record a diary, etc. We show this uh, to them. So let me show you a quick video of it. Uh, and not to take out of your time, I'll try to uh, make it a little faster because these are the things that I just explained. So this is the um, clinician app. So they create a patient record here. And these uh, data will be visible also in the app in the mobile app. So this is the mobile app. They install it. They use the pin code that were given to them later. Ah, yes, right. Can you hear us okay? Maybe have a technology glitch. Mm 
But I see that Gathi can you unmute it. Okay, so I think I got dropped there for a second. Um, uh, sorry, so you can see it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so the, after giving the permissions to the app from the device, they connect their uh, Bluetooth device, uh, the bracelet, and then these are the data that the clinician had entered. So they are greeted with some notifications. And then, um, you know, they see the app is empty, of course, when they start, but they need to do some things. And they start, uh, we tried a bunch of things. We tried automatic collection from the, uh, from the bracelet in the background, but there, there were all kinds of issues with it. So we decided to, there was a, a process here. We decided to make it manual for the patient like this. So they decide, sit down and then they uh, let the, device measure their blood pressure and other things in a uh, explicit uh, session like this. So once it is collected, it is displayed. And when they want to see what's going on, they can look at what's happening. This was also important because uh, there were sometimes issues with the bracelet, they didn't know what's going on. Uh, so it was good to give them extra information. And if there is data, uh, it is shown here like this and they can, provide their emotional status like this. Um, and they can provide their diary recordings. Uh, they clicked on, a, on something here uh, that required them to do these things in order. Uh, so they can watch it later. Uh, only the uh, clinician would be able to see it later. And it is used for depression detection and things like that by uh, the partners who are focused on the AI part. I'm focused on this uh, user interface part mostly. Uh, and there are a bunch of other things in the app. They can see their messages. They can see their uh, the data graphs. And there's basic information which will be populated further as our project uh, progresses. Knowledge base about cancer for them to, uh, you know, uh, get information. And this is our questionnaires. They get to choose and answer, also they come in with uh, notifications to them. Uh, they answer these questions and it is recorded in the big data platform as they answer them. And of course, the, we, have, we have a CDSS, which will be creating alerts as uh, they see, as it sees um, things that are concerning and it would be sending to the clinicians app and notifications. So those parts of the project is ongoing still. So that's how they answer the questionnaires. And of course, there's multi-language support because we have uh, patients from different countries and they get to manually enter data as well. Uh, so I hope that's going to fill our charts a little bit. So if they have an issue with the bracelet or they somehow uh, get this information, maybe they, at night they want to take it off because some patients do, uh, so they can also enter their uh, data like this about sleep and other things. Uh, so it's displayed in the charts, heart rate, blood pressure, as you would expect. This was supposed to say blood pressure, yeah. And So I can move further a little, they, they enter the date, they see graphs of this data and they can enter new ones to see changes here. Yes, and the deep sleep versus uh, general sleep is also accounted for. The bracelet sends this data to us, uh, but when it's manual, they have to uh, enter it like that. And yeah, they get to enter their steps and it appears in the main screen. We are hoping to provide the like, goals that, that are set up by the clinician. Uh, but for now, uh, this is where we stand with the app, more or less. Thank you for listening. Uh, this was our presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kashan and, and, and Victoria. Um, 
I, I think it was a very impressive um, presentation and, and uh, I learned a lot. And I have some thoughts which I'd like to share with you and, and then we, we, we take a look at the, the poll in a second. But my thoughts were is, is um, in, in terms of, of patients, how many patients had you got in, in the trial you were doing roughly? Do you, can you recall? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have uh, four uh, hospitals in the in the consortium, and they provide forty patients, uh, twenty four breast cancer and twenty four colorectal. So, in in total, uh, one hundred and sixty patients. Okay. Um, in terms of time to to enter the data, you, you said earlier on that they had to sit down because of some obviously technical difficulties of being in motion. How long does it take for a patient to, to complete the data and, and send it to you roughly? Uh, those who use the bracelet, uh, they, they find it uh, easy to use it. They only have to complete the questionnaire and uh, we never send the, those questionnaires uh, to uh, too soon. I mean, maybe once per week, uh, we send them uh, some questionnaires uh, because we understand that patients would be bored if we uh, force them to to complete those questionnaires mm, too soon. Yeah. And even though we would like to to have uh, the information <laughs> close, so we notice uh, any little modification in, in whatever. Uh, circumstance but uh, we know that they they wouldn't be bored and, um, and I think that uh, we they shouldn't uh, uh, spend more than don't know uh, 20 minutes per week no more if they use the bracelet of course if they have to ingest data manually because they don't want to use it uh, it would be more so on the ecosystem, when you have, have the details coming in, and, and forgive me for just, just staying with this, this thought, um, the physicians who are using the results, are they seeing value coming through? Are they seeing um, they've more time to do other things because the data is already coming through that they, their, their decision making, what they're going to do that day has improved? Or what, what are the benefits you're seeing coming through at this stage, Victoria? Uh... At this moment, they uh, we are still developing the some some models for prediction. So we didn't want to to show them, uh, let's say, the, the alpha models, and uh, we aren't showing them any uh, prediction. They are just uh, uh, following the reviewing the data is what they can do at this moment, but they don't uh, see any prediction. Uh, they will do it in our next uh, phase uh, of the clinical study, uh, which uh, will start uh, by May, uh, approximately. So I, I cannot give you any result uh, regarding clinicians. Victoria, I have a question. Uh, Tom, yeah. may may I go? With Absolutely. The yeah. So, um, what about this information that you will provide to clinicians? Um, mm -hmm. Do you expect this to affect somehow the clinical practice? And if so, do, have you considered of uh, the possibility of uh, certifying your solution as a uh, medical device? Yeah. Um, I don't think that. Uh, we would go uh, with the certification uh, in the time frame of persist uh, because uh, this is a very long process and you have to uh, to, to achieve a, a very accurate results but of course our intention is that uh, all the predictions uh, the, the early detection of a recurrence or uh, uh, whatever prognosis we can do about also anxiety depression everything uh, will help uh, clinicians in the day-to-day -day work uh, is is a uh, is our intention is our goal but uh, certification uh, is is a, a very very long-term process so i don't think that uh, we have uh, roughly one year 
to to finish the the project. So I don't think that we could achieve it inside our frame, uh, our time frame. I, I I'm I'm asking this because uh, you know we, we were involved in such kind of discussions in our life science project as well because we also provide insights to clinicians and we were you know sometimes uh, challenged by the clinical teams of uh, whether we need to consider what we are going to develop as a medical device and probably need to consult with you know uh, agencies etc national agencies etc so. This is uh, just a, a comment uh, because we had to deal on ways of how the clinicians will interact in the end during the pilot study with the uh, clinician's dashboard. That that was my, you know, my my thought. Uh, if if you if your main worry is. Uh, uh, obtaining feedback about clinicians. Of course, we are going to to have some usability uh, questionnaires for them, uh, just to know if they find it useful, friendly, useful, <laughs> because uh, clinicians have a, a very uh, short time to to make. That's true, and is a challenge. <laughs> is a challenge for all of us. Yes. I yeah. mean, we, we do not want to put more uh, b burden on, on their shoulders, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Thanks. We've got another question coming in from the chat. It's from Nivida, uh, and it says, can patients also create alerts from the app about their health? Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, in fact, we discussed about that uh, during uh, our uh, co-creation <laughs> meetings, also with clinicians. And um, in the end, we decided not to do it because uh, clinicians um, uh, cannot uh, review the, their application uh, as soon as, uh, as frequently as an emergency room, for example. So we didn't want to uh, give them the feeling to the patients that we that persists in an in emergency room. So we avoid this approach and we clearly stated that uh, if they feel uh, unwell or they feel that um, some important issue is happening to them, they should go to the emergency room. Because, uh, uh, because of this, we avoided uh, uh, to, to create alerts for on patient side. It's very good. We've got one more question coming in from Palos, and um, he's asked a question uh, to well, Gashem and also Victoria. And <laughs> Maybe guys, then you can answer for a while. Gives Victoria a break. It goes. Uh, uh, did you do you do you have any issues during the ethical application with persist being a medical device? Uh, how did you circumvent them? Uh, well, probably Victoria would be better to answer that. But <laughs> I can tell that uh, the device is not. You know, it's not giving medically accurate results. Uh, we are you know, using it, uh, but not telling people not to trust the actual values, just to see if there's change in trends. Um, so there I can see an issue, but please, Victoria, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, as, as I can say, um, since the device is not as accurate as a, a device, uh, a medical device that good to measure the blood pressure or heart rate. We just focus in following the, the evolution. So uh, let's say that we see the, the, the difference between one day to another and, and not just in the exact values. And uh, uh, regarding the, um, I don't know if uh, Panos is thinking about the, the ethical approval in hospitals. Well, uh, we went through through that. Not, not sure if, it, if 
this question is also related to that. But if uh, you are meaning that uh, we went through the ethical committees in hospitals, they were very concerned about the, um, how the patient information uh, was going to be stored. If uh, in some clouds like you know Google or this kind of platforms. And uh, once we explain that uh, we have our um, a big data platform that the, for example, the, um, the bracelet the device uh, doesn't store the information, it's not a, a Fitbit device. So, uh, for example, <laughs> yes, talking about Fitbit because I saw, I saw it in, in previous presentations. It's not a, a, a typical uh, commercial device. So all this information is not stored in a third party uh, cloud platform. It's everything in our platform. Um, we, we went through the ethical committees in, in hospitals and um, we didn't find too much problems okay. to get approval. And perhaps I'll answer the last question, but it's okay with everybody. And then we just go through the poll. And, and my, my question is that who owns the data? <laughs> Yeah, uh, the, um, we have uh, signed several uh, data transfer agreements. Uh, so the um, the owner uh, is the um, is our hospitals, and they uh, transfer to technical partners. We have signed uh, individual data transfer agreements uh, with uh, the four hospitals, and uh, once we we. Um, we finish the, the study, uh, uh, we will uh, delete the, the, the information which is not used for, for the initial purpose, which is sustained in the data transfer agreement. Yeah, so beyond the, like, the project, this is um, something you're, you're going to think about. Um, because during the clinical trials, I understand, but beyond the clinical trials, when, say, the, the solution goes to the marketplace, that, that, that process will be all taken care of in due, to, in due course. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. And I, I, I think that I think I get the picture. And, and Victoria and and, and Kirsten, you guys have been great. I'm so sorry. I'm rushing a little bit at the moment, but I know we're running out of time. Um, you've been fantastic. We're going to do quick polls now. So, if perhaps um, we can get the first one coming in. And um, as I said earlier on. Can you see my screen, Tom? Yes, I see it loud and clear. Welcome back. Great. So again, if everybody can do it, it's it's, it's this is the the first of two questions. It says uh, since you were a child till now, uh, to what extent do you agree IT technology has improved the health services? This is a very general question, that, so I think anybody can answer it. Again, if you go to the um, uh, mental.com, uh, 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 click on that, you should be bringing there. And this is the code number. It's um, it's it should work this time. I know we had problems a moment ago, but I think that should work. Uh, shout at me, scream at me if you're having difficulties in, in, in using it, and we'll try to sort it very quickly. And uh, I, I, I hate repeating like a, like a, like a broken record, that, uh, but these poll questions are specific and they do help. Uh, I, later on, we will analyze it, so um, I, I would encourage you to, to, uh, to answer it. It, it, does, it does help us to, to look at it later on and, and try to get some general feedback, which will help us in our direction we're going to do in the various projects. Um, so we're waiting for just a little bit longer. I count down to 15 and then we move to the next question. So 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We're there. <laughs> Can we switch to the next question, please? Okay, uh, so this is the next question, and, and this is the final question for Persis. And again, my thanks to all of you, you've been brilliant. How willing are you to share your private health information with technical entities to help them in their research? Okay, I think we leave this one a little bit longer. <laughs> Mixed reaction there. Um, please. Uh, by all means, keep coming on. I think it's a very important question. It's really poignant to what we're all doing in, in across multiple projects, not just through the persist project. So please, please uh, 
give us a response. We will look at this one carefully, and uh, this is something that we may be able to use going forward when we're talking to the European Commission. So, so please, please um, stay with us a little bit longer, and then we go. Um, okay, okay. So that's that's it. Um, we will stop this again. Um, my thanks, Victoria. Kishan, you've been guys are great. I love what you're doing. I think it's brilliant. The feedback you got, you, you got, I hope is very helpful. We will now move to the second uh, of, of the uh, projects in the, this afternoon session. And this is going to be Qualitop. Uh, and, and quality